Fritzi Pass is from Cape Town, um, well, more specifically from Stellenbosch, and um, she's going to be talking about the venous injection. So welcome, Maya. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Right. I'm sharing my screen. So my topic is uh, dependency injection, dagger, hilt, coin, a comparison. And if you need to speak to me, there is my Twitter handle on screen. Right, let's see. So at this point, I would ask for a show of hands. Who's used dependency injection? What do you use? Do you use coin? Do you use dagger? But I can't see you. So I will just have to assume that I'm going to have the right mix of information for both beginners and people who have used some dependency injection already. But if you do have questions, please put them in the chat and I'll get to them after I've finished my slides. Okay, so the first thing is, what is dependency injection? Now, dependency injection is just a software pattern. And basically what we're saying is that I've got a class. This class needs something. It needs this repository. I'm not going to new this repository in the constructor of the class. I'm going to pass it through the constructor so that I can control the creation of these classes outside of my class. So you give it all the all of the, so this view model needs a repository and all of the things that it needs you pass in through the constructor. So you do no local construct construction and it's also called inversion of control. Okay. So the next thing you'd ask, well, that's all very good, but why would I need this? So the first reason why you would need this is for loose cou coupling. So what it means is that your object, the object that you're focusing on, all it knows how to do is its particular task, and it doesn't need to know how to construct any of its dependencies or any dependencies that depend on other things. The next reason why you would need it is for testing. So if you're just wanting to test your object, but you don't want it necessarily to hit the network or do something slow, you can pass in a mock in the constructor and control the data like that and then manipulate the object and then test it properly like that. The third reason is to reduce cognitive load. And what this means is that if, if there is a dependency, if things depend on each other when they get constructed, you don't need to know about this. Once it's set up somewhere in the app, you don't need to worry about this when you're coding up your object. Again, reducing boilerplate, same reason. If you've got news all over the place, um, then you don't need to repeat that code. You can just have it in one place. And then this last one is quite important for me. It actually separates out the testing. It means that when you're testing your object, you're testing the business logic. You're not testing the business logic and the construction and the related objects with the construction. So that could make your test simpler. And also, if you're using a framework that builds the dependencies um, in code or that has ways of testing it, this construction testing is actually can actually be automated. Okay, so then when you start searching around for dependency injection on the internet, the first thing that you'll come across if you're in, in an Android space um, is Dagger. Now Dagger, then you think, okay, right, Dagger, what's that? And then the first sort of reference point to this is there's a, in set theory, there's a thing called a directed acyclic graph with that very, very long um, description below it. But all that that means is if you look over here, these things, the arrows only flow in one direction and it doesn't make loops. And that is there are no circular dependencies. And now when you're building code and you have pieces of code that depend on each other, this is a very useful way of representing that because that's exactly what we want. We don't want circular dependencies. So at this point you say, right, that looks great. Give me one of those graphs, I'll build it in my app. And then you start searching Dagger and then this happens. Well, this happens to me. I get all of the stuff and the examples are strange. And, and then I see this Android Dagger and I'm not sure which one to use. And at that point I start thinking about coffee because there's so many coffee examples. And then I start wondering where should I be putting all these things? And then I say, oh, but I just want to code my feature. I don't really want to know all about this dependency injection and how it actually works under the hood. So to solve this fruit salad, lettuce salad problem, I'm going to take us three different paths through this. The first path through is the manual way, right? You say, I can code. I don't need a framework. Let me code it myself. This is this first option. The second option I want to look at is coin. And then the third option, which I'm going to spend a bit more time on, is this hilt option. 
And this is here. This is um, a new library that's coming out as part of Android 11. It's based on Dagger, but it's um, it works very nicely with Android. Okay. So and so now dependency injection on its own is quite abstract. So to be able to understand how to fit this in, I'm going to take an example of an app. It's a toy app I built for a previous talk. It's a simple eight ball app. You can ask it a question and it'll answer in a simple eight ball kind of way. But it's a little bit smarter than a normal eight ball. You can also ask it, um, if you give it more than one word, if you give it more than one word, it'll be the eight ball. If you give it one word here like this, it will give you a synonym. For this though, it needs to go on the internet to go and fetch the synonym. So it hits the network for that one. If you type in password, it's going to hit a different API endpoint and it's going to give you a password. If you type in a number, it's going to do a sum, which may or may not take time, and it'll give you an answer and tell you if the number is prime or not. So just a little disclaimer at this point, there is going to be some code coming up, but you don't need to remember any of it. There's a GitHub repo with all the code, the whole sample app, and it's got a branch for each of the dependency injection styles so you can compare them and you can look at that at your own time. So if we look at this toy app that I built, this is the architecture. The architecture is the exact architecture that is prescribed by the Google um, architecture components. And it's really simple. It's got an activity that doesn't have a lot in it. It's got a view model. It's got a repository. And this question repository can take multiple different sources for the questions. And these different sources of the question, they all um, adhere to a single in interface. You ask it a question, then it pops an answer back. So the eight ball, what it does is it will take a random time. So for testing, you can see this is possibly not such a good thing because if the eight ball is going to take a random time every time you run it, it might make your tests be a bit strange. The prime number will just do a calculation and then the synonym and the password will hit the network to get the answer. And if you look at this architecture, you can see the obvious places where one would want to inject would be at this point, if I'm testing this question repository, I would want to inject these different interfaces over here. If I'm testing my view model, I might want to inject a re question repository like this into the view model with different kinds of other um, functionality, either mocked out or not. And the activity, I want to inject the view model. Okay. So, so now here's my first top testing tip. If you're writing objects, try as far as possible to pass everything you need through the constructor, because this is just going to make your testing much easier. Okay. So now if I'm doing this myself, I've got constructor parameters and I can use Kotlin default parameters. So what I do is I set up the default parameter to be the one that I'm using in production. And then when I'm testing, I can just override these default parameters. And then that's like a simple way to just inject what I need into the constructor. But now if I'm looking at my activity, the problem is I don't have access to the constructor of the activity that easily. So I'm going to need to at some point do what they call field injection. So that just actually means that I need to get hold of maybe the, the repository or something inside the activity and where am I going to get this? So typically what one does if you're coding it up yourself, you make a container object, either it's a static object somewhere or you have an instance of the object inside your application and then your activity gets a handle on the application and then can ask for whichever things it needs. Okay. So this is just the same architecture diagram, but with a manual view, this is how you'll do it. Over here, you'll use Kotlin and the default um, parameters, const uh, constructor parameters. Over here for the view model, you can also do the same thing because it also has a constructor that you can pass in. And this activity, oops, it's, uh, slide, slide, slides, come back, yes. So this activity, now this, I'm on coin already, that's a bit far right. In the application, you'll make an object or a container, either a, a singleton object or a container, and then if the activity needs anything like the repository to pass it into the view model, it will just get it from the application. So now you've got this, you're writing the unit tests, they look great, but then when you start writing integration tests, now you actually want to inject um, you want to inject something else that doesn't go onto the network or you have to make a separate network 
um, server on your on your phone or something and it starts becoming complicated and you think all right let me have a look at a framework and let's see if there's a framework that i can use um, to help me so the first framework i'm going to look at is coin so the main features of coin is it's got the service locator pattern which is that object where you ask for a dependency and but this is basically inside of a library it doesn't have any annotations it doesn't have any code generations which mean that your build speed is is not going to be impacted it's quite easy to grasp because the the concepts that it uses are this quite similar to the manual way it's a complete kotlin library and also it has a dsl so the dsl makes it quite easy to configure it it knows about view models, so it's actually quite easy to inject things into view models. It knows about application contexts, and it has a way to swap out the modules for integration tests. So you think, okay, great, this is a good one, we'll try this. And if I look at the same architecture diagram, over here now you can see in the same injection points, what do we do? So the view model we can, we can get hold of by doing this by view model call. Anything else we can say by inject, and this inject method will actually go and get it out of the Kotlin, uh, out of the coin instance. Um, if you need a, an instance of an object, you just call this get method, or in this case where there are these interfaces, they're all named, you can get a named interface as well. So that these are the kind of calls that you would make at these injection points to get hold of these things. But before you can do that, inside of your application, you have to start coin this with the DSL and potentially have a module to set up all the things that you might need for your app. So I'm going to just show you the code quickly. So in your application, this is what it would look like typically. You'd say start coin and then you just give it the modules that it needs to include. And this is typically what a module would look like. You can have factories, you can have singletons. Here I've got interfaces. They're named interfaces, and here's the repository, and here we can see the named interfaces going into the repository like that. And after you've set this up like this, you can just call a get or inject by, and you'll be able to get hold of the instances of these objects. Okay, so now the thing is, now I've, I've put here what about runtime crashes, because what COIN doesn't do, COIN doesn't have that acyclic graph and doesn't actually check all of the dependencies if there aren't circular dependencies, um, at compile time, which Dagger does. But Coin has given us an easy test to run. So if you just run this test as part of your test suite, this will actually do the check and tell you if there are circular dependencies, and this will save you from runtime crashes. And this test also has a Gradle um, command that you can do. So you, as part of your build system, you can actually run this test and make sure you don't have any circular dependencies. So here's a quick recipe. If you want to put Coin in your app, what you would do, You'd add the library to your Gradle file. You set it up inside your application and set your application in the manifest. You'd make your different modules. Uh, you'd use constructor parameters as far as you can, and you get those constructor parameters with a get call. You write your unit tests as normal because you're using um, constructor injection already for your unit tests. And then if you need to have integration tests, you can swap out the modules for test modules in your integration tests with Coin. Okay. So now I want to move on to Hilt, which is the new kid on the block. It's um, based on Dagger. It's the new official Android uh, dependency injection suggestion. It's consistent. I'll explain a bit later what that means. And it's opinionated. Um, what you need to do for Hilt is you annotate the injection points. So those injection points we had on that diagram, you, can, you annotate at those injection points and you annotate the providers. It's got a basic library that you can use to inject the normal things. But then if you want things like view models, there's an Android X library that helps you with um, Android X components and, and helps you to inject those. And the other great thing about Hilt is it knows about activities, fragments, views, services, context, broadcast receivers, and more. It supports integration tests quite easily. I'll show you, it's, you can swap models out, uh, modules out quite easily. And then also because it's official, another big benefit is in Android Studio 4.2, um, there's IDE support. So you can actually see where when you inject somewhere, you can navigate through Android Studio and find the places where it gets provided. And there's a really handy cheat sheet. So 
So let's just take one step back to Dagger. So Hilt is built on Dagger. So this means that you can have Dagger pieces and Hilt running at the same time. But now in Dagger, they always have this component and then they have these modules. And that always confused me because the modules I can understand, I can see that's where I actually build the objects that I need. So the definition I found on the internet is the module is an object that knows how to instantiate objects. And then Dagger has this component, but typically when you look at people's apps, either they put everything in the app module or the main mo uh, app component or the main component, or they start splitting things up. And every single app I've seen has got a different way of splitting this up. So even though I understand what a component is, when I read a new app, I've got to learn the way that it's been put together. So this is the point where the opinionatedness of Hilt comes in. So what Hilt does, it's this, the modules in Hilt are similar to Dagger. There are some differences, but they are similar. But Hilt provides pre-built components. So you don't ever have to build a component. If you're using the standard components, you don't have to worry about the components. They're already pre-built. The other thing about these components are they are scoped. So there's an application component that will live as long as the application. And then there could potentially be activity components or fragment components that are scoped in life cycle to match the pieces. So it's quite easy to generate like some objects that only live as long as a fragment and other objects that only live as long as an activity or some singletons that live as long as the life of the activity. And you could potentially add custom components as well. So here's a picture from the Dagger documentation, just showing all of the pre-built components that you get with Hilt. So you get the application component over here, and it contains all the singletons in your app will go in this. And then the service component, activity retained components, they can see everything that's inside application component. And then there's this activity component, which is activity scoped, and it can see all of the things that are up in the tree and likewise down here. So there's fragment scoped, view scoped, view scoped. Um, so you can see that the, the light blue is the component name, and then that's the scoped annotation. So now if I go back to my architecture diagram, what I need to do is, all I need to do is I need to annotate my application with this single annotation. I don't need to do anything else inside the application. The next thing I need to do is the places where I want injection, I need to just annotate them as an Android entry point. By annotating this Android entry point, I don't have to do anything that's inside. The, in Dagger, you used to be able to, you had to put code inside on create. You don't need to put code in on create. And then you can just use at inject to get hold of the things that you need. And this view model, you can just use at view model inject. So this at view model inject comes from the Android X libraries. And constructors can also, you can you can show that something is injectable by with the inject component um, annotation in the constructor. And then you can also build modules which know how to provide these different other objects. So this is what it looks like in the, the Hilt application. So if you've got nothing else in your application, all you need is this. OK, so now I just want to talk about modules a bit. So normally, if you just have a class that doesn't take any other parameters in here, all you need to do is add this at inject. And then Hilt will figure out that this is an object that needs to be injected. And you don't actually have to put it in a module. But sometimes you've got an, something that implements an interface. Or you've got a third party object. Or you've got something that takes some other configuration within its um, constructor parameters. And in those cases, you would put them in a module. Because you actually need to write some code to make the instantiation of these objects. So here is my second top testing tip. If you need to decide which pieces to put into modules, I would stop for a moment and think, besides splitting them logically, I would think about which pieces might I want to swap out for something else when I'm testing. For instance, if there's something like the 8-ball interface that will take an indeterminate amount of time, that's a good candidate to put in its own model because then it means I can swap in a test eight ball that never takes an indeterminate amount of time that always comes back with an answer. Likewise, for network modules, that would be um, some good interfaces to put into a module. 
So here's an example of this exact eight ball. So there you can see it's a module. And this is a new annotation at install in. And then here it's actually saying which component do we want this to be in. So by putting it in the application component, this thing is automatically scoped to last the whole of the app, the time of the app. And so here I'm making a singleton. I'm giving it a name here because it implements an interface. And so, and this is just the way that you would make a name um, for the annotation. So it's got a name here, eight ball answers, and then it says app provides, and then here's a function. And then here you can see, this is just a singleton, but you could have whatever you needed in here to instantiate the object that you might need elsewhere in the app. Okay. And so this is the app module. And this is there you can see is the question repository. It's providing the question repository and it's got these things in it. There they are with their names, but these would be provided by other modules in the system. And this dispatcher provider was just a class that I had with an at inject that what you didn't need to put inside a module at all. So the next thing to notice here is that these little symbols, they're new. And by clicking on these little symbols, it helps you to navigate to. So if you click here, it will tell you where the where this eight ball interface could be provided. And I'll give you an example here. So here I clicked on that little eight ball, icon, the icon in the gutter. And here I can see that the, my test is giving a version of the eight ball and the eight ball module is giving a version of the eight ball. So it immediately makes it easy to navigate through the different dependencies. So this is an example of the IDE support. So here's what it looks like if you're trying to do injection inside an activity. You add at Android entry point at the top of the activity. And then this is there's the question repository that we just saw in the module. And all you need to do is say at inject, basically saying, I need this from dependency injection. You no longer need to do anything in the onCreate code. So in Dagger, you needed to add some code in onCreate. And this is what the view model looks like. At this point here, I just say add view model inject constructor and it will sort everything out. So now the next step is here unit tests. Now, if you've been doing this constructor injection, your unit tests are pretty easy because you can actually, you can actually um, in inject all of these things by hand without needing any dependency injection framework because you can just construct them as you need them. And this unit test example will work in any of the dependency injection branches that I've got here. So now I'm moving on to integration tests with Hilt. So you have to do some dependencies in Gradle. There's a custom test runner. Um, I suggest you read the docs. I'm not going to go through the detail here because it's um, not that interesting. There are just a few steps to do. But just it, to move on to the actual tests, this is what the test would look like. So the first thing to notice here is I can uninstall modules. So I defined all my network classes inside the network module and my April class inside the April module. And with this annotation, I'm actually saying remove these modules from my dependency graph. Then this is just the normal run with Android J unit four. And here I'm saying this is a Hilt Android test. And then I need this Hilt rule to my tests. So automatically by doing all of this, I'm setting the dependency injection up, but I'm removing those two modules because I can provide them myself. And I'll show you on the next slide what that would look like. So inside my test, I can just write a test module and I can inject this inside the application component. And over here, I can just make an eight ball that just always returns this string. So this is a really, really easy way to um, insert test modules into your dependency graph. So you can add any app provides that you need for your tests inside your test module. And then the test itself has no idea that, that the modules were swapped out at all. In fact, this test just looks like a normal espresso test where you're clicking on the question, setting a question, clicking on the fab, and then getting the answer. Right, and there we are. So that was easy enough, setting it all up, and I can run all of my tests, all of my integration tests, with no network hits and no strange, flaky timeout problems. So the Hilt recipe is add the libraries to Gradle, set up your application with a single at annotation, make your modules with your with installing and provides, installing it in the correct components, 
use constructor inject when needed. And if you need a parameter, um, you can use the inject method and then add your integration tests and your unit tests as necessary. So I'm going to contrast and compare quickly. So now, service locator versus dependency injection. So this is the big debate that everybody has when they talk about dependency injection. It's the elephant in the room, and I haven't really even mentioned it, so I'm going to mention it briefly. So Jake said some stuff. Martin Fowler said some stuff. Then Reddit said a whole lot of stuff. And you can go and read that Reddit thread yourself. But the crux of it is the one, that's dependency injection, uses diversion, inversion of control, but it is more complex. Now, a service locator is like that static object that's sitting in your application, and you actually have to ask for your dependencies from it. And this really means that every single object that needs objects needs a dependency on the service locator. And in a way, it makes it opaque. It means that you can't really always see how these things get constructed. And all of this issue is, as I see it, only because you can't really access the constructor of the activity. Because if we could access the constructor of an activity, we could just pass in the objects that we want. But I mean, the service locator is also a pattern and dependency injection is a pattern and they've just got pros and cons. So I'm back to contrast and compare. So the manual method, there's zero extra bytes I'm pulling in. I said sort of because you're going to end up writing a whole lot of your own code. It's pretty simple. It's really quick to get started. There are no extra libraries. There are no code generation. The cons are there, are, there could be some boilerplate because you could be copying things over and over. Um, it's quite tricky to manage the containers with the objects creating, especially if you start wanting to scope things, like you want things only to be there for an activity or a application life cycle. And then if you start scoping things, you've got to manage the memory yourself and you have to manage the life cycles yourself. And then you can get weird bugs and it, bugs, and it actually gets pretty complex pretty quickly. Um, and you'll need an object or an application access to get hold of the injection of the objects if you don't if you can't construct or inject coin i think it linked in about 600 bytes the pros are it's actually pretty easy to get started it's easy to understand it's got a really simple dsl it's got multiple modules there's no code generation the build is quick there's no reflection so it's actually pretty easy and quick to get going um, there is some startup time before the startup time used to be um, slower than it is lately. That's much improved. And there's this thing with runtime errors, but you can mitigate that by having appropriate tests. And then HILT, I could only see 41 bytes that it was pulling in. But again, it's going to generate some code. So it's again, it's a 41 bytes, but it's a sort of, but it's because some of the code is being generated. The pros are it's Android official. It's built on Dagger, but it's easier to use. It's got IDE support. It's Android aware. It's build type aware. So what this means is that it can traverse and it knows about build flavors and it can pull things together for the different build flavors. It can coexist with Dagger and there's a really um, useful migration and document, how to document from Dagger. And there's a really good cheat sheet, good documentation and code labs and videos. And there's lots of information about it at the moment. Some of the cons though, it's an alpha. Uh, it's an annotation process, so it's gonna code generate. It's going to use that capped um, code um, annotation processor, and this could make your build slower. Uh, it has some limitations. There's some things that it can't do yet, but it is in active development. If you want to see what issues um, Hilt has at the moment, there's a link there to the issue list because it's all open source. So you can actually see what people are doing on the library. So which one do you, should you choose? If you've got a really small toy app, I would just draw my own. If I've got a medium to a large app, if you can't use Hilt because it's an alpha, I would consider Coin or maybe Dagger if you've got hair on your teeth. If you're happy to take Hilt or you've waited until Hilt is um, past alpha, you could choose Hilt or Dagger. But what if you already have Dagger? I would just leave it alone. Or if you really want to, you can migrate to Hilt because you can have both at the same time. And now it's time for questions. So the QR code is usually for big screens, but there's a link. We can paste the link um, in the chat 
and you'll find all of the resources in that repo. It's got a branch, the master branch, which has got the manual thing in it. It's got the coin branch and the hilt branch. And so you can actually see. And the other useful thing on those branches are the commits are the actual steps that you need to take to add the pieces one by one. So that would be a good resource. And now I'll take some questions. Cool, Maya. So I brought my last time I when you did this talk, I asked you whether um, if you ran the, the Magic 8 Ball app, whether it, it would say that Hilt or Coin is the better one. So I tonight I brought my own Magic or 8 Ball <laughs> to really see what is <laughs> whether whether Hilt will really be better than Coin. So let's check it out. Oh. Most likely. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. So I guess that says settles and you said hilt. My magic eight ball says hilt. So. Most likely. <laughs> okay. So we have some questions for you. Um, what do you think which one would be good to use in MV MVVM in Android, Dagger, Hilt, or Coin? Uh, my personal preference, uh, MVVM, I don't think it's a problem because you've got view models and those view models just take the objects in and you probably have some repositories. I would pick either Hilt or Quinn. I wouldn't go Dagger because it just makes my head hurt. Um, if you feel strongly about not having any annotations and not generating any code, I would consider Quinn. If you feel strongly about following Google structure and, and official things, um, and you don't mind it being an alpha at the moment, I would go Hilt. Mm -hmm. um, so we have Chester Kubis asking, um, does Hilt use reflection? No. Um, and Trust just saying, um, quoting you on saying, if you could use Dagger if, you, <laughs> if you're okay. <laughs> It's a very yeah. translation of, of a saying. <laughs> Maya, thank you so much for, for speaking for us tonight. And it was really awesome. Um, it was a really awesome talk. So um, I'll definitely add that link onto um, the chat. And if you want to see the, um, or if you could add the, the link on, onto the chat, I'll add it onto the stream chat. 